Why am I emphasizing this so much? I am emphasizing it because in the search for the self, people have gone everywhere except within themselves. That is why I am emphasizing that the direction of the search, the direction of seeking is not right. We are going outside when we should be going inside. We are trying to look out for something. Even looking at a mirror is not looking inside. Looking inside means withdrawing this attention. These currents of attention that are flowing out, giving us the feedback of what is around us, turn them around to get the feedback from where we are sitting inside. How do we know where we are sitting inside? Use common sense. A simple answer, but very few people do it. So I've come to the conclusion common sense is very uncommon. <laughs> Otherwise, people would do it. That common sense says, if you want to know how to put your attention on yourself and you want to know where the self is, just feel it. Experience it. I am talking to you. Are you listening? From where? You are not listening from your chairs where you are sitting. You are sitting, listening inside the body somewhere. In the head. Somewhere. Where is that? Where is that location? Where can you pinpoint the self in this body? From where you are listening to me, talking to me, giving attention. I said, look that side on the wall. You turn around. Where do you turn it around? Where do you give the directions to your body? To act as conscious beings. If you apply a little introspection to the situation, that where are we operating from in the body? It doesn't take long. We are not operating from the toenails. We are there. We can feel it. Our sensory systems, our nervous systems give us all the information of the whole body. But we are giving directions and receiving it somewhere behind the eyes in the head. You can close your eyes and see. Where are you? You close your eyes. Where are you looking out from? You are still looking out. The fact that these physical eyes are serving as, as, as a level to show where we are is amazing. You close your eyes, where are you? You can see you are still operating as a person who can see from behind the eyes. You want to say, where is my throat? You want to close your eyes and say, where is my throat? You know it's below you. You put your hands on the side, you can say, they are on my side. Where are your ears on this body? Close your eyes. They are on either side of me. This simple introspection tells us that consciousness per se, which is our real self and the knowledge of which can give us real self-esteem can be very easily discovered by putting yourself exactly where you are, which is behind the eyes. Behind the eyes, but not behind two eyes because we are one. When we close our eyes, do we feel we are two persons or one? One. One being. If we are one conscious being behind the eyes, where are we sitting? On the right eye or the left eye? Or somewhere in between? Let's figure it out. Let's close the eyes and see where we are. When we close our eyes and we figure out where we are, we discover we are sitting somewhere in the middle. And we are also way back, not in the eyelids. If we touch our forehead and the back of the head, we can discover there is a point. There is a point between the eyes and the back of the head where we operate from. And if we were just one molecule, which is consciousness, it must be somewhere in the center of the head behind the eyes. That point in ancient Sanskrit literature was called the molecule of the self, the till, the single particle of the self. And I read that first and I read those scriptures in translation at Widener Library in Harvard, not in India. I was amazed that here is a description of the location of the self in the wakeful physical human body that we are behind the eyes at a single spot which is focused like a triangle. The same spot was called the third eye. The same spot was called the seat of the soul. The same spot has been called in different texts by so many names, but they are all referring in the wakeful state to the same point as the point from where we operate as the self when we are awake in the physical body. And yet, have we ever turned around to see that spot? Do we know where it is? If somebody tries to see it, he gets a headache. I sometimes in my workshop said, try and turn your attention. Put your attention on the third eye and many people end up with headaches. The rest end up sleeping. Why is that? Because when we try to see that, we are still trying to see with these eyes. If you saw the eyes came close to that person and watched the eyelids, what they are doing when they are trying to put attention inside is, they are trying to twist these eyes to see backwards. As if the physical body is a reality and we are trying to see the, the location of something elusive behind the eyes. We forget these physical eyes are seeing because we are sitting behind them. 
When we don't, they die and they can't see anymore. We forget that is the self, not these eyes. But so used are we to, and so accustomed to seeing with these physical eyes, we try to twist and turn the physical part of self and get headaches. Or we try to relax to go back to that level. And in trying to relax to go back and not think of other things, we relax and allow the attention to drop and we go to sleep. We are used to it. Every night we go to sleep. Every night we change our location in the body from that third eye center behind the eyes to a position in the throat and the heart every night without fail. Did you know that? Every night when we go to sleep, why are we not awake? You can, people are, people in uh, sleep uh, classes and sleep clinics and sleep uh, analysis are thinking so much, what is sleep? They don't know what is sleep. Why do we sleep? Where do we go when we sleep? What happens? And answers to these questions were given thousands of years ago. They never bothered to see that when we go to sleep, we are not behind the eyes. When we are behind the eyes, we are always awake. No person can go to sleep and still stay behind the eyes. If you relax and let that focus, let that third eye center <coughs> drop, that means you now feel you are behind the eyes. If you start feeling you are not behind the eyes, you are behind the nose, you will start feeling sleepy right now. If somebody has insomnia, doesn't know how to sleep, that person should assume or imagine one is in the throat, you'll get sleep quickly without pills. You can try it. The real reason is that in this physical body, we feel, we experience our self behind the eyes only when we are awake and fully awake. When we are fully awake, we feel we are behind the eyes. When we are not fully awake, we are in a state of relaxation, we shift downwards. You can do an experiment. Tonight, when you go home, try an experiment. Just before going to sleep, you say, where am I? Behind the eyes? Okay, you can touch, touch the eyes with your hands and you know the experience. If you put it here, you will know you are below that. You put it on the cheeks, you will know the eyes and where you are looking out from is above that. Then you allow yourself to relax a little before sleeping. Then say, let me touch my eyes again. Close your eyes and say, let me touch my eyes again. Raise your hands to touch your eyes, to touch your nose. It will amaze you if you haven't done it before. It will amaze you that you will still thinking you are touching your eyes. You won't feel you have come down anywhere. You will feel you are touching your eyes and you bring your hands up and touch your nose and say, watch this. And then next time you do it, you touch your eyes. Every time you sleep, this focal point goes down. When you're dreaming, it's gone down to the throat. When you're in deep sleep and forgotten your dreams, you're down in the heart. These focal points, and you can take it further down, and the yogis deliberately by methods of meditation, take it down to all the different chakras or centers below. But these are normal for all of us. People say, I want to go to the heart chakra. They don't know every night they go. Every night, every person goes to the heart chakra without knowing it. That's when you sleep and relax and you wake up in the transit, you pass through the dream stage and you wonder, what's happening to me? What happens? All this is an experience of consciousness while in the physical body that you can have the experience of sleep. That is why to go back onto the third eye center, behind the eyes and to stay there while awake is one of the greatest experiences one can have. That is the experience of knowing where the self is. It is not an experience of knowing the self. It is an experience of knowing where the self is. And if you can know where it is, you'll one day find out what the self is like or who the self is. So the first step in self-realization in order to build up self-esteem of a real enduring kind, not a shaky one, not based upon misrepresentation that the mind is the self, is to go within and find out where the self is and then to question from the very self What's this going on? To be able to communicate with one's own self. One can never communicate with one's self except when one is with the self. We say we miss company. People are lonely. People don't know what to do. They run out to make friends. They, people lack company. People living in big cities also lack company. I have found everybody lacking company here. People have company which is very temporary. After a while, they get fed up. There's no understanding. They are not, in, not at the same wavelength. They are not in tune with each other. They looked very much in tune when they first met, which is superficial. 
the relationship with people is skin deep. They can't think deep and have the same kind of feeling, same kind of spontaneity, same hunches, same intuition. They can't have. No two people for a sustained uh, length of time can say we live on the same hunch and the same intuition. So they break up. So they have no company. They try to find modified company. No, this was not the right one. The other one is my soulmate. We are in a search of soulmates to find company for ourselves and yet we never have the company of our own self. What a tragedy. That our own self, which is the best company you can find, is inside, within, very close, a few inches away. And we are traveling miles to find superficial company outside. That companionship with the self, if you experience that, it's an amazing experience. It tells you that what you thought was yourself was not real and what you are now discovering is the real self. This great experience of finding out the self is what all the mystics and masters have recommended that we should try to do. Find yourself. Discover yourself. Know who you are. Know yourself. You get to know that, your loneliness disappears. You get permanent companionship. And since you have made this mistake of constantly thinking that uh, the self is the mind and we have to find other selves which are also physical and mental, when you discover your own self, it is so beautiful an experience. You associate it with the master, with the teacher, with the guru, as we call it in the East, who gave that expression to the self. And then we begin to love. People say, why do you need a master? Why do you have gurus in India? The reason for having gurus is not merely to have a teacher. We can have teachers. There are a lot of them in universities. We can set up a new university and have plenty of teachers to teach meditation, to teach the art of withdrawal of attention. The guru does not represent merely a teacher. The guru represents a being with consciousness who was able to introduce us to our own self and therefore represents the extension of our real self outside. That when we close our eyes, we are with the self. When we open our eyes and look at the guru, we are with ourselves. That great experience, you cannot get anywhere else. People don't understand why we have this kind of feeling for a guru, for a master, for a perfect living master. Not for a master of imagination. Not for a master who gives messages from the mountains or Tibet or somewhere. A master you can see physically like we see each other. Why do we have that experience? Because we realize that the master is not a stranger. The master is not somebody we have to find out and cultivate and know. The master is merely a form representing our own true self. It's a great experience. There's nothing like it. If you can show me an experience parallel to this, I'll certainly exchange it. And in all future workshops and lectures, I'll give the new formula that you give me. I have not found it all my life. That the truth of oneself can be discovered and can be enjoyed within and outside. This is possible only when we go within and find what the self is. That is why the perfect living masters about whom we talk with such reverence and such affection, they have never come in this world at any time in history or contemporaneously to come and say, go and look, we'll tell you where the truth is. They have never drawn us to a truth outside of ourselves. They have come and pushed us back into our own self to find the truth. And then after pushing us into the truth, when we look at them, say, but who are you? It doesn't matter who we are. You can call us a brother, you can call us Mr. So-and-so, you can call us master, you can call us a friend, you can call us an enemy, you call us whatever you like. It hardly matters. But do what we are saying. After you experience the self, you can call us what you like. After we experience the self, we discover that was part of an experience generated by the self. That what we thought was an outside person who came into our life was no outside person because there is no outside of consciousness. That consciousness generated this series of experiences here and consciousness also generated the experience of a loophole in this experience in the form of an outside person who looked outside till we found within that that was the inner core of our own self. Somebody described it in a different way. That God and the seeker, the soul, both are inside us. Our soul pining to have a look at God is inside. God waiting to be seen is inside. We never meet each other. Both inside and we are sitting like strangers and looking outside. When will we see God? How can we find God? And God is sitting right inside, right next to us. What a tragedy. And we can't even know about the tragedy because we don't look inside. But God is there. He waits. He waits and he says, 
I am next to you. Why don't you see me? And we look around. Where next? Which side? We are still looking outside the body, not inside. What can God do? He said, okay, if you are so adamant in looking outside, he jumps out from there and comes outside. Do you see me now? Yeah, you are a guru now. Now I can see you. He says, uh, now, but I am, not, I am not God. I have come to tell you, go back inside. And we go back inside and we find the same guru inside. And we say, God, you were here. So I was here all the time. You wouldn't look inside. Therefore, I came outside to push you back to where the reality always was. I'm giving you an example that the truth, even of the creator, the truth of what has created the whole universe and all experience is inside this physical body. We don't know. We don't know how to get there. And therefore, even the truth has to appear in some form outside to push us back to the location of reality inside. So my simple message I started off with, which I have embellished with all these so many words, is there is a storehouse of experience. There is a generator of experience right inside us. If we can master the art of turning our attention back to the third eye center behind the eyes, we can get all the answers we want. And that experience is not based upon thinking, not based upon rationalizing, not based upon logic, not based upon what you can see and hear and believe or not believe. It is based upon love and intuition, based upon beauty and faith. Those characteristics of consciousness are there without having to come outside to practice them. Till you can find out how to go there, look for the opportunity of finding somebody who knows all this, has experienced all this. Make friends with such a person, because such a person is not really like anybody else. Such a person is not a friend like other friends who will be leading you to friendship outside. Such a person takes you back to the real friendship inside and makes you discover that such a person was your own real self. That's a simple message I came to share with you. I hope some of you who will come to the workshop will join me in experiencing some of these things so that we can do some meditation and see how we can really divert our attention from outside to inside. Then, discovering the self, we will have real self-esteem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer some questions if you have at this time. If you have no questions, you can give me some answers. Yes. When you talk about perfect living masters, what do you mean by the word perfect? Uh, we have so many masters who teach you to go within that we have reserved this phrase perfect living master for one who takes us to the perfect top of all this. That means to the totality of consciousness. There are masters who can take us to our astral self, the sensory self. In India, we call them yogis. And there are others who are sadhus who take us still higher to the mental levels, universal levels. There are others who take us to spiritual soul levels. So we have given different names to masters of different orders. When we talk of a perfect living master, we are talking of one who has personally experienced that perfection with totality within. And therefore, he can share with us that experience of perfection. Yes. Um, would the per perfect living master be constantly abiding in the state of oneness with that totality or would he be separate from it discussing it and describing it you know uh, one with a second rather than one without a second he'll be doing both like a person sitting on a chair can daydream he's in a bed is he in a bed or is he sitting in a chair and teaching would he be teaching as the totality he's teaching as totality the perfect living masters teach us totality, but the vocabulary used will be at one step higher than where they are teaching. Just one step. Because if they teach from totality, they have nothing to teach. There is no one else to teach. Therefore, they teach just one step at a time. And at that step, we are in the physical plane. If we are in a dream, if we dream of a perfect living master, when we are dreaming, they are at the wakeful state. And we know when we wake up that that was a message for us. There's a wakeful master. When we meet the master at the wakeful state, they're teaching from the astral level. You know they are taking us within to a higher level. When we are at the astral level and we meet them, we know they're teaching from the next higher level and so on. But at all times, they are teaching in their consciousness from totality. So a perfect living master. Yes. I've heard a lot about meditation. Now, I knew, I knew in these meetings 
does one have to prepare the mind and does it take a while to be able to meditate? That's what I'm trying to say. To be able to, to go within. Yes, there is preparation needed because the mind is so polluted by desires and attachments that if you try to meditate while the desires and attachments are still there, the meditation does not become successful. While we are meditating, the mind is thinking of all the attachments and all the desires and therefore we get up tired and we don't get the same effect of meditation as we would if we were prepared. Prepare the mind for meditation. Well, there are some simple rules uh, of preparation uh, which uh, many of the religious teachings tell us how to be kind to people, how to be detached, how to love God, have faith, how to have vegetarian good food, simple food, natural living. So a number of these things prepare us for meditation. When we are reasonably detached and our body is not filled up with too much of junk, we begin to feel that the meditation becomes more useful. It's a long process. It depends on where we are at this point because none of us are starting from the beginning. The fact that you are in this meeting shows you are not at the beginning, obviously. Those who are at the beginning don't want to come to the meeting. So it is a it is a process. Then the one thing is we are all in the middle of the process, on the middle of the path somewhere. The second thing is that how fast we go will depend upon the intensity of our seeking. We may be all caught up in a lot of attachments, relatives, others who are pulling us down, but the seeking which has been placed in our hearts by the same source which is pulling us, that seeking can be so intense. We say, forget about all this. I want to go. I want to fly. And in spite of being caught up in a mire and marshy land, one can be pulled up because of seeking and go fast and fly. Others watch. Why? We were ahead of that one. How did that one fly first? So the intensity of seeking, the love and devotion that we have makes for speed in meditation. Welcome. Yes. How does one find or recognize a perfect living master? It's not possible. You can't find. Because if you could find really, then you are a master. Therefore, one can only be ready to be found. You cannot find. You have to be ready to be found. That is why in the Eastern text we say, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. They never say when the chela is ready, he will find a master. When the disciple is ready, when the seeker is ready, the master appears. If the master does not know the seeker is ready, he is no master. Obviously, from what we are talking, the master's consciousness is total. He should be knowing about every possible seeker, and especially the seeker for whom he is in embodiment as a master, thereby creating a special relationship between the sheep and the shepherd, the marked sheep and the shepherd, not all sheep. The marked sheep for whom one particular individual may function as master, that particular seeker, if that seeker is ready, the master by coincidence will come into that person's life and we will be found. Second part of the question is, if we are found, how do we recognize? That's also a tough thing, how to recognize. But there are some simple guidelines, four or five guidelines you can use to recognize if this one who has come into my life could be my master or not. And I again specify my master or not because it's possible that a person is a perfect living master but not my master. He may be master of my neighbor, but that person does not represent myself for my experience and I have been ready and therefore I am waiting. That person may be perfect, but hasn't come into my life. When a master comes into our life, how do we have a checklist to recognize that master? There are some simple rules. One, if the master has come to give us, he will give us, not take from us. Rule number one, I'm putting, I'm changing the order of the rules. In India, I put this as the last. In the United States, I put it as number one. <laughs> because we come across a lot of fake masters who come to exploit us and take from us. And how can they be masters if they want, if they say, give us $25 and we'll pray for you and send you to heaven, how could they be masters? I can understand that part. If they are dependent upon us and seek from us, how can they be the givers? So the first sign is, such a person, a human being, who is a perfect living master in his consciousness, is a giver, not a taker. He's come to give, to share with us, not to take from us. Secondly, if he really has his consciousness in totality, he will treat the whole of creation as his own. He will not say, this is my group, this is my religion, this is my 
cult. This is my this thing. These are my people. The rest are not. That's not my creation. If a person divides and says he's only got these people and not the rest and is not universal, he could not be a perfect living master. Thirdly, if such a person comes from the totality of consciousness and believes in this nature of consciousness where love and beauty and joy are at the highest level, how could he come and express hatred for anything? He'll be full of love. Associating with such a person will generate love in us, not hatred, not difference. So if the personal experience by being with that master gives us feelings of love, it's a good sign. If it gives a different feeling, walk away. Fourthly, if such a person is himself identifying with the creator, with the total consciousness, and he has come to work within the framework of what is there, not to break it. He will not come to break the natural laws here to prove his point. He will not come and say, I'll fly in the sky to show you I'm a master and break the laws of gravity. He'll walk and trip over so you can help him and catch him and say, are you hurt? He will be so human that he will follow these rules and yet his love will be so immense that you will know he is not an ordinary person. This combination of being totally ordinary and totally extraordinary will be found in such a person. If he is a perfect living master, if he is a master who has uh, acquired some powers, he will show those powers. Perfect living master will never have to show powers. Therefore, he doesn't have to perform any street miracles. He will perform private miracles. Things that will happen to you can not happen except miraculously. But when you tell your friends, this is a miracle, they say, what are you talking? That was just a coincidence. That kind of personal miracle within you will perform and remain ordinary for the rest. Finally, such a master, if he's come as your own totality, he doesn't have to say he's a master. He'll never have to claim he's a master. He won't even say he's a master. He'll say he's not even a disciple. And thus remain anonymous and remain to be discovered by the seeker through experience rather than by claim outside. Here are just a few points on the checklist. When you're ready, I'll give you a longer checklist. Any other question? Yes. Said in the East that, it, that the self is existence, consciousness, and bliss or joy. Or love. Those are the natures of And I, I come to think of that as, as the joy is the heart. The, um, the consciousness is where you're sitting in the head or sleeping in the heart. And the um, existence is the totality of that consciousness, which is undifferentiated. If that's correct, then the experience of bliss, is that something that the consciousness experiences emanating from the heart? Everything, many gurus do think about the heart as being the center of it. Everything is being experienced by consciousness because there is no other experiencer. We don't have any other experiencer. Wherever the experiencer is, that is where the experiencer is experiencing bliss, joy. If it is in the heart, it experiences the heart. It experiences behind the eyes when it is there. In the wakeful state, experience is there. In the heart state, experience is there. But when we use the word heart as the center, we are not referring to the physical heart. A lot of people start thinking that the, that the organ heart which pumps the blood is what we talk about. When we say speak from your heart, we are not talking of that speak from this heart. This heart neither speaks nor thinks, nor has intuition. All that is somewhere else. When we say the heart, we are trying to distinguish between the head and the heart. These terms are used symbolically, the head for intellect, the heart for intuition. So we are not talking of a physical heart or a physical head. We are talking of the one relying upon thought and intellect and the one relying upon intuition and faith and love. So the heart represents faith and love and intuition. Yeah, when, we, when we talk about the experience of love, many of us do experience love as emanating from the vicinity, the physical vicinity. Mostly women. Of the heart. <laughs> you know that? Is that so? Yeah, because when you associate, there is another element that we miss out sometimes, which is called emotion. There is another element which we have not brought into this discussion at all called emotion. The emotions are all emanating from these chakras, especially from the heart. Now, that is the physical heart level. The emotions are actually coming from the physical heart level. When one is having the joy and spiritual feeling, the emotions join with it. And therefore, the feeling is from the heart. So, the emotions are a physical phenomenon, but they can get coupled up with spiritual experiences also. That would be what, what some would talk about as being shakti or energy or whatever. That's also one of, the, that's one of the physical experiences in the throat. 
So these are different levels and these different experiences, they get associated with the spiritual experiences. When we are in the physical body, we don't really cut ourselves off from other experiences. Like this question was asked just now whether the totality operates as totality even at the other levels. Yes, not for masters, not only for perfect living masters, even for us. A person who is having an emotional feeling in the body can have an intuition coming from the same soul, not from the body, and it gets merged with that experience. You never know which one is which. In fact, you cannot have the experience of love except from the soul. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It doesn't exist in the mind. You can't think yourself into loving. You can think as hard as you like. So love comes from the soul by itself. And when you love and you think beautiful things about the beloved, you are coupling the mind and the soul together in the same activity. When you feel the experience of love and physical closeness with the beloved, and you think about the beloved, have physical closeness with the beloved, have good sensations with the beloved, and also are having love, all the systems are coupled together. So it's not necessary that you have to leave the body to have experience of the higher self. You are having experience of the higher self right now. Is that the actual existence consciousness bliss merge? That's right. It, that's where it merges. They merge there. Yes. Um, I, can, I can think of four masters. Um, Two are contemporary and alive uh, that I know of, and two who are uh, gone for some time. I'm, I, I know that you're acquainted with all of them, and their, their names really don't matter. Um, they mention the same differentiation between the physical heart and what you might call the uh, the heart chakra, mm -hmm. um, and they add that there is a a heart center of consciousness. Of consciousness, sometimes they refer to it as the heart cave, and they describe it as a bad the width of two fingers to the right of the center of the breastbone. And I say it is not the heart chakra. Um, and if there is a physical center for the self itself, for the totality, that is the, uh, the location and the body. Yes. If the physical body were the reality, that would be it. If the physical body were the reality with no thoughts, with no spirituality, no soul, if nothing else was real except the physical body, that's where it would be. It has been described as the great aorta, the great blood vessel coming from the side of the heart. It has been described in many ways. But that does not take away from the fact that we are not physical body alone. And therefore, uh, merely relying upon that definition of the physical body to praise the physical body takes away from the teachings of these great masters that don't forget that consciousness is what you have to look for, not the body. Yes. Yeah, I heard President Bush uh, talk about today uh, the joy of this military victory over uh, Iraq. He used the word joy. I'm wondering if that's truly possible, could it be true joy, and if you comment on the war. In every one of us, there is a child. And uh, when the press secretary, one of the White House aides, mentioned this morning that President Bush came walking outside, and he found that for the first time they were showing film uh, on video of how the precision bombing had hit the target so precisely, he got brightened up and sat like a child in front of a video machine. And he would put with his finger and said, boom, boom. Did you see that? Okay. So you see, in every one of us, there's a child who comes up and thinks that there is a great video game going on. The truth is, it is a video game. It doesn't look like that. Only once in a while we feel it's a video game. <laughs> well, uh, uh, many. how many of you are coming to the workshop in the morning? Okay, oh, lots of them. Thank you. I'll, uh, we'll go through more of these questions at that time. Is there a, a word in Sanskrit that talks about heart, which is not the same word as the organ? Is there a separate word for it that has a separate meaning? Yes, it means heart. Literally, it means heart, but it does not mean the physical heart. So this head and heart has been used frequently. And uh, uh, one reason why it was used was that when we think with the head, think hard on a difficult subject with the head, we can get a headache. But when we are disappointed in love, we get a heartache. None of the headache is real in the head. The heartache is not in the heart. But heartache is an experience you cannot locate. If you did try to locate where is the heartache, you might still put it here. It's not the heart. 
Thank you very much. Good night and see you some of you tomorrow.